October 29, the year of date, 1974. I gave birth to him <laughs> October 29th, 1974. He's my son. Just a real dynamic little boy that grew up to be a dynamic young man. Damien, you know, he was he was always a preppy boy. Yeah, his mom kept him prepped up. So uh, he was he was cool. He was uh, generous. He that, now Damien didn't play no games. Now. If Damien got into an altercation, he'll talk it down first with his words. But you're not going to do what you think he's going to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he actually lives in the community where uh, my business is. And actually, I actually grew up in that community also. I own a barbershop. I've been in uh, the city of Forest Hill for now 35 years or so. Okay. And he's, uh, he was actually a client of one of uh, my barbers. And so that's how we formally met, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I used to cut his hair at uh, a barber shop in Forest Hill about 11 years ago. Um, uh, but I knew him before I started cutting his hair. He was going to other barbers. And, uh, but, but basically, we connected so good to where he started letting me cut his hair. Very different, when I say different, you don't meet a guy like him every day. Uh, once you meet him once, you'll never forget him. Uh, he brings such humbleness to the table, uh, very um, full of wisdom. Um, and, and, and uh, he greets you with a smile, and that smile is a million dollar smile, and he's just genuine, you know. He, there's not many categories you can put him in because <clears throat> he's one of those guys that he, it's almost like y'all are relatives and you didn't know it till you get, went to the fair reunion. So he's one of those, once you meet him, he's like family, you know. Uh, and I loved him. Uh, uh, just like a relative, you know. Uh, me and his dad knew one another, you know, and uh, uh, he's done some help for me with uh, painting rigs. Uh, I had a paint rig that had broke down when I first started my business. And uh, I went to his dad and his dad fixed my rig for me and never charged me for that. And, you know, and so that's the personal part that I wanted to speak on it, you know, family. Uh, also his mother, you know, uh, She's always uh, been there for me on just a call. The call was uh, one time uh, uh, I had to uh, lock some keys up and she went away from one part of the town and came over and gave me the keys from my mother's house. So, you know, that's what I mean personal. I met Damien many years ago, I think. Initially it was a friend of a friend that we met. Um, and then again, I believe in 2007, um, he was coming in to my organization to get certified. He kept getting the run around and they just didn't really give him good customer service. And then I saw him out there and I was like, man, I know that guy. And then came out and you know, we had an opportunity to talk and kind of been friends ever since. Well, I would say you have to meet this young man that is full of love, he's gifted, he's talented, he's on fire, he's just um, loving and love the Lord. You got to talk to him. Damien Dalcord, the first word I would say, he's a man of God. I think he's intelligent. I would say that he's very ambitious. Um, I would say that he's just, I always say, if he can't fix it, it can't be fixed. Stern. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, uh, very, very stern, um, but, you know, uh, he taught me a lot, you know, because I was green, very green when we first met, and 
I, I just want to share this one part. I remember the first uh, venture we had, uh, we did a roofing job. And uh, he put me on the roof and he took off. And now I had no experience at all about roofing, but you know, uh, he always believed in you know, uh, uh, either a man or a mouse, you know. So, um, you know, I had to put, he also believed in putting your big boy pants on. So um, um, that was one of the things that, uh, that uh, I learned and admired the most about him was that I got put in a position, you know, to be able to see if I'm really built for this. And this has been over 12 years ago. So, uh, you know, I've gone through a lot since then. So, you know, some of the things that, uh, you know, that people share with you through our lives, that, and, one, and he's one of them, uh, uh, he's been inspired to me, inspiration to me. You know, so. uh, he was my frat brother. He helped pledge us and stuff. Uh, uh, Navy comrade, we was in the Navy together. He was different, you know, uh, but he was a good man. You know, he, uh, he'll tell you the truth and he will listen to you. But uh, he, he was a couple eggs short of a dozen. I think anybody that plays IOTA has to be a couple eggs short of a dozen because we're not a traditional kind of frat. You know, we're much older uh, people that join the frat and stuff. And so he was, he was a little different, but he was a good man. I always knew that Damien was going to be something. It, it, it was just, you, you could see it, you can feel it. it. It was always, you can feel it when he talked, the things that he did, you know, like I said, as far as helping and, and, and being proactive. So that, that's inspiration, man. Because I, I tell my kids, if you're going to hang with somebody, Hang with somebody that's that's about something, that that wanna that have goals in life and that's acting on those goals, not the ones that's gonna do this and do that. And uh, I worry about it two or three years later. You gotta act now. Um, he can push you, and I think he sees what you may not see in yourself sometimes, but he'll continue to push you. And then you'll, if you take a moment to really think about all the things that he's doing, you'll be like, now I see. The, Damien is very, very outgoing. And it's surprising to me what he'll do next. Like this is a big surprise to me because whatever he put his mind on doing, he did it. And if he wanted to do something, he's very successful at it. So he, that's, I guess uh, that's the personality that I see the most in him. So nothing never surprises me, just like now. You know, what is he up to? But he is the kind of person, he's gonna keep it to himself and he's gonna accomplish it. So he, growing up, he was just, I, I was fascinated. You never know what's gonna happen next. But it made me proud. One of the things that really I thought about is when I saw his name on a street corner and he didn't tell me he was running for office. And he just happened to be standing on the corner, like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, I'm running for office. <laughs> Why do you tell me? Oh, I just wanted to surprise you. <laughs> I'm like, wow, you don't see that name on the corner. You're like, what? It, oh. But yeah, he's, he's a go-getter. His eagerness to want to do things for the community. Uh, when I first started, you know, that's what a lot that we did, was we did a lot of community work. We um, we done a lot of cleanups around with um, uh, graffiti. That's how me and his ventures first started. And it was like, you know, busting your knuckles and getting out there for the city and really doing some things. We done some trash details. And so he was always doing community. Uh, you know, that's where I really got into it. At. And you know, and when I first got there, he was like, you know, where'd you find this guy at, you know? And so, uh, um, you know, uh, we've been friends ever since, you know. <laughs> For a long time, man, I just really didn't care about the political aspects. You had these group of people and these groups just going against what each other said. 
it was logic in both sides. And you would think they would just come together and say, okay, that's right. You know, I use it a lot with the math. You know, 5 plus 5 is 10 and 1 plus 9 is 10. We both right. In most cases, when you hear out the true argument, you know, okay, there's some, le some legitimate aspects and characteristics to both of them. I got into politics back in 2008 as a city councilman. I was asked. I had the mayor of uh, Forest Hill at the time, James Gozy, to come by my home. And I think someone had made it known to him that I was very inclined with, you know, uh, handyman attributes. You know, I have a plumbing license, I do, you know, roofing and all this other stuff. So somebody got word to him that, hey, he need to go holler at this dude. He had some duplexes and all that stuff that he was overseeing. So uh, he came to my home one day and he sat in my office and as he looked around, he says, you know, you the kind of guy we need on our city council. You know, my master's degree is in community development, so I have a lot of outlooks on how community comes together. You know, I uh, spent some time as a commissioner for zoning and planning for us here. So, sometimes people be like, well, I don't even know what that means. Well, planning is what you want to do. Zoning is what you can do. So that's just a quick way of putting it. I spent a little time as a code enforcement officer. So all this stuff kind of derives into something. So now that you're just not up there, it's easy to go win an election, but do you really know what it takes to, to hold it down? Because folks be calling. I got a possum in my backyard. Well, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Well, just close the door. <laughs> he calling me. <laughs> but duty calls, you got to get on over there because this is one of the folks who, who support you. The people put you there. 2008, when I, well no, I met Damien before then when he was a kid and he was coming over to the house to uh, interact with my kids when they were young and I can't tell you how old he was at that time or whatever, but they were in and out or whatever. But back in 2008 is when I really paid him attention because he was trying to run for city council as well. So we both was running for city council and we decided that uh, we'd run on the same ticket, you know, to kind of help each other out or whatever, and we won. So, uh, like I said, Damien has always been like a, I always had looked at him like one of those kids that grew up with my kids as a kid, but he was always a mannerable person. He was always a person that uh, was respectful. I wish that everybody would know his heart. He has a heart that's of gold, and he loves people, and he loves helping. So he's, had, he's got that personality. Uh, my fun, I guess it's not funny, but, uh, I think once he started letting me cut his hair just because of the chemistry we had, he had a different texture of hair. He has a fine texture of hair. In some spots, it grows different. Well, I wasn't too familiar with just the fine hair all the time. He would always say, oh man, just cut it, man. Just cut it, it just has it. No, it ain't just hair, because I'm looking at it, and if I cut it wrong, it's gonna leave a bald spot or patch. He said, well, guess what? We'll just cut it all off. It'll grow back. <laughs> you know, that's how he talk. And I'd be like, man, you're something else, man. So he, that's the funniest part, I think, maybe. I cut his hair one time and it, it, it we had to take it on down to like, and he started wearing it bald for a minute, I think. But he didn't give me no static about it, you know. He was like, man, it'll grow back, it's just hair, you know. So that's the fun part I meant is that when you, even when you make a mistake with him, it's still fun. You know, it's not nothing that he got mad about and didn't want to pay, you know, that type of deal, so. Um. In, in the grade schools, we, we lived out in Como. So Como, Morningside, Tanglewood, Middle School, uh, Glencrest, Forest Oak, and high school, you know, we had Arlington Heights, Southwest, Nolan, and then Trimble Tech, where we graduated from in 93, which is another good year. So very active in the sports, very quiet, 
you know, didn't really have too much going for myself because, you know, I didn't have any brothers. You know, I had a sister, but, you know, you wanted to be cool, but we really wasn't too cool, you know, because, you know, you do. You want your sister to hook up with some of her friends, and she never was going for none of that. So I was like, man, what's going on? But, you know, I, I really didn't play the part. I didn't have too much good attire or any of that stuff, so I just stayed on the low. <laughs> How was it like being on the council with her? It was good. It was good. We always worked together. We never, I mean, we were almost, we were always like uh, on the same page. So uh, if he had an idea or if it's something I felt strongly about, he'd listen to what I, you know, would suggest. And if he had something or I had something that we didn't agree on, we could talk about it. And that's a good thing. Without, you know, nowadays you talk to people about issues they don't agree, you have that falling out. That's not Damien. You know, he'll listen to what you got to say, he'll take it, put it in his pipe, smoke it, and then, you know, we'll talk about it. That's amazing because we have so many similarities and then we're just the opposite. And the great thing about our podcast, what people love this, is that, you know, Damien is going to just speak his mind. And so we can literally, you know, disagree in the podcast and we still find a way of coming back. And, you know, I love the fact that he's a praying man because he always ends our podcast in prayer. And I think that's powerful. Uh, that's, the, that's one of the things there. You know, we respect one another. There are times when I know he needs his space and I'll back off. And so um, he doesn't need the nurture or he doesn't need that person. You know, he's like, Tia, you can't change me. And I respect that. Uh, but I, um, I still see him as... We just, we just have a bond, and I, I, what I love also is that my mom, uh, before she passed, she knew him just a few, for a few months, and he would send her the most beautiful prayers. And to see how my mom was going through sickness, and she would have me to read the prayers, and she would say, read it again for me, and read it again, and she said, oh, he's so sweet. My mom absolutely loved him. And she would send messages, and she, she didn't know his name, she, you know, she didn't know that. But she had such a touching uh, feeling towards him. And so, of course, that, that really drew my attention to know why does my mom, you know, love him so much and has not, has never met him. And so uh, definitely, that definitely had a lot to do with, you know, even the way that I feel about him now, because I know my mom loved him as she would have another son or something. She wanted to make sure he was okay. You know, I first met, uh, uh, up to this day, I still call him Councilman Daco. He was young when I met him, but he did an excellent work for the city of uh, Forest Hill. Uh, Councilman Daco worked well with Mayor Gozi. They, like I said, both of them went to Perry View A&M. They are both engineers. I think uh, Councilman Daco also has a degree in architecture. And he has a master's degree in some kind of a planning and economic development. And uh, I, I, I was honored to give him a recommendation for his doctorate uh, program. He's working on doctorate degree part-time uh, as we speak. So he's a man with a lot of talents. I always like to see a young man trying to make something good out of himself because uh, uh, that is what we need. These are the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, Councilman Dalco was very instrumental in moving the city off from the old building that this city has been since like, uh, I wanted to say the 60s. We moved into this place in 2010, the city of uh, Councilman Dalco was one of the seven people that voted for that to happen. Um, he was also involved in, in, uh, in the transaction with, uh, with the Chase Bank. Hold on, let me just say this to you. And the city hall project is an important one for the citizens of Forest Hill because it gave, it gave us hope. It makes us to have a better place to take care of the business of the people. Uh, Council Madako was in instrumental in in, uh, in in helping us to get.
to this level. Another project that we did together was the Memorial Park. The Memorial Park out there on Forest Hill Circle is a replica that came from uh, Washington, D.C. And it has the five arms of the military service there, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine, and the Coast Guard. Um, when Councilman Dako was on the council, what we tried to do is to bring all the veterans. He's also a, an uh, uh, Iraqi veteran. Um, we, we brought veterans in during the Memorial Day and during the Veterans Day. And uh, we all meet at the Memorial Park, after which the city will sponsor a lunch at Lubis and try to uh, feed all the veterans. Uh, Councilman Dalko is very instrumental in a program like that. Um, we, we, we work together with the Forest Hill Civic and Convention Center. Uh, it's a big center that uh, we have on, at uh, 6901 Wichita Street. We have a grand ballroom that we sit between six to 800 people. And then we have about 10 meeting rooms inside the convention center. It's a very big uh, uh, building uh, for this town. Uh, Councilman Dalko was also very instrumental in lowering the taxes. Uh, since I've been in the city, we have dropped the property tax in this city by more than 10 cents. Now that may not sound like a lot of money, but when you're talking in terms of uh, large sum of money uh, it's a lot of money so we save the citizens of uh, forest hill uh, to we allow them to pay less when it comes to property tax and the economic development function that has been happening like uh, the starbucks around here councilman Darko was instrumental because we sold the land uh, next to us to starbucks and then uh, qt on the other side, uh, you, that build that land there used to house uh, Chevron gas station, and because of his leadership and the rest of the people on the council waiting, we are able to bring QT, and QT now brings a, a lot of tax dollars when it comes to sales tax into the city of Forest Hill. I, I like to see him when he works with the children. He goes around sometimes. Uh, and we have a program in July, Family Fun Day, whereby you see him coming in his shorts, and then uh, we have sports, and uh, he's a friendly man. I always enjoy seeing his son, Xavier. Uh, whenever they are going together, he goes around with his son, and he's proud of his son. I'm sure Xavier is grown now. I'm sure he should be on his way to college by now. Councilman Dalko, I really learned from his dad. And you see them just like he's going with his son. When his daddy was alive, he tried to go around with him. There was one time I saw them in front of the whole city hall, posing in front of that Mercedes Benz. Politics, man, is. If I had to express how politics is, and politics is gangster, it's more gangster than them streets. So I see them, but uh, them guys out there sagging with their pants. No, that ain't gangster. This politics is, is gangster for real. And you get to see, it, you know stuff that you really don't want to know. You need to know certain things because they'll come in there and tell you something that ain't true. That ain't no fact. You got to do that fact check. So it gets real, it gets grimy at times. That's why I got the heck up out of it, man. Cause if I didn't get up, if I didn't get out of it when I did, it's probably gonna come up missing or something. I don't know. Cause, Cause people wanna hit you at all angles, and and you do. You always wanna be doing that continuing education. When they get the opportunity to go somewhere and learn something, go, go do it. Each year on that council, I received an award from the state of Texas, from the Texas Municipal League. I was utilizing those funds to better myself. Which, which I think was expected of me. And some people be on that council for years and they ain't never done nothing. So, politics, man, it just opens you up to things that you don't want to know and having to do stuff that you really don't want to do. And it, it, 
I had some allegations against me. You know, I had some allegations pressed upon me. They was lies, but you start thinking like, dang, how can they do this to me? And then turn your world upside down, big time. You know, I thought you think you have a friend and you can confide in that the person who came to me, I shared some stuff with him about the war. Shoot, he, he got mad because I didn't want to utilize my business for, for a personal gain. So, you know, let's, let's just keep it like this. Well, it, it brought about some, some, some negativity. You know, I done got you in this, dude. You know, I need my cut now. Well, I don't really want to cut it that way. But when you make the wrong person mad, they can make a lot of things go wrong for you. I wind up in the psych ward. Because I shared some stuff with him about the war and my nightmares. Stuff that I had been already evaluated for. So I had to turn myself in. Wasn't nothing wrong, but I had to spend two hours under observation dressed just like this. You got guys walking by you talking about, are you a doctor? No, I'm a, I'm a, in, I'm a patient just like you. You know, somebody pulled a, pulled a plug on me, now I'm here. And you know, they look at you, you know, you seem to be dressed really nice and your hair is cut. Yeah, well, I thought I was normal, but here I am. So, you know, then they make a few phone calls. Well, we're going to release you. We just got to make a couple of more phone calls to make sure. And then you get your belt back, <laughs> your shoestrings, you know, anything else with some type of elasticity in it, <laughs> you know. You, you can get dressed outside. Thank you. So this picture of his, this one is really, this is a picture of his dad, which I think probably looks the most of where Damien look, falls his, looks like. He, this to me is just looks like a young version of Damien. But this was his dad. This is his dad, Gino. And then this is his Gino's. That's my granny. So that's Mildred. And then that's Penny. That was here. So sister and brothers. Okay. I think, you know, for the most part, man, you know, I always wanted to be with my dad, but I think before I really knew my dad, I think dad had some things going on that he'd never recovered from, from Vietnam. Um, and he was affected with a herbicide called Agent Orange, which actually led on to me having some of the side effects and the birth defects. I had three of them. Of the 18 on the list, I have three of those birth defects. So knowing about those birth defects at a young age, kind of ruined me a little bit because I, I, I always thought that I'd never be able to have children. You know, uh, I wouldn't be accepted by, you know, society because, you know, I have these dirt birth defects. We know because none of them are, are visible. And, you know, I had to educate a guy one day, like, not all disabilities are vis visible, you know. Some people can be deaf and you won't know it, but it's because it's not visible. So, Dad had some things going on in his life that he never dealt with. Later on, I felt that dad didn't really have a, a good relationship with his mom and dad. His mom left his dad to be with another guy who I grew up knowing as a pawpaw. So dad was on them drugs. He uh, had that post-traumatic stress. And you know, as a child, you really don't know too much about that. But I know my dad was always, when I did see him, he was always happy to see me. He'd always teach me things and he'd always scoop me up and take me with him. And I think those were some of my best moments. And I think when sixth grade came around, they picked dad up. As soon as I got home from school one day, my auntie came and got me from school. And, and when we got back to the house, they was walking him up the street in handcuffs. And that was it. And I think I seen him a few times downtown on a Sunday for visitation and after that to TDC. So from sixth grade up until 2004, you know, cause he, he got out, but he revoked it and he had to go right back. So childhood was kind of unique because outside of my father, I had my uncle Charles, which is my mother's youngest brother. It was five of them. And uncle Charles was the uncle that was sly, he was cool, he was hip, and he was the one that when my daddy wasn't around to kind of keep the boy in there. You know, he gonna throw you that football hard and he gonna rough you up. 
and he gonna grab me up sometimes and, and roll. You know, he rode around, he had that bird, and I'd be right there in that front seat and we'd be flying up and down the streets. We wasn't thinking about no seat belts, <laughs> getting pulled over, you know? I'm looking at him like, yeah, I can't wait to hit that bird one day, you know what I'm saying? So, Uncle Charles kind of played a part why dad wasn't around. But then too, dad didn't have no job sometimes. He was in between this and that because construction went up and down. So dad would walk from his mother's house where he was staying to my grandmother's house in Como. About two, three streets over, about six, seven blocks apart. You know, so three streets over, eight blocks that way. So he'd come down there and get me. And you know, sometimes he'd be smoking that weed, that joint. They were big on joints back then. Wasn't no blunts yet. <laughs> So, and he'd always be drinking that bull. And one day he came down to my granny's house and he was like, boy, are you ready? I'm like, yep, couldn't wait for you to come through the door. Cause, Cause like I said, granny's house, it was just a bunch of women. Couldn't do nothing. So we were walking, one day he had left his beard on the, on the rock fence in that sack. You know how they do with the sack. And so we went on up the hill and I was happy. We would, we'd walk in, holding hands. And he paid me that bird. He was like, you know what to do. Sure do. I hit it for the first time. And it was nasty. I was like, God, dog, I ain't gonna ever drink this no more. But later on, I see how that relationship, you gonna drink a bird, but anybody, it's gonna be me first. So I remember that like yesterday. Can go to that exact spot where I hit the can right now. And be like, yeah, we was right about here in the street. <laughs> yep. And I hit that, that bull. So when dad went to prison, it, it took a lot from me because I had to go home to my mama's house. And because my mom and sister had some issues, it left me there by myself. See, growing up, see, I had my sister. She was like my, I used to sleep on her floor next to her bed. And I was scared to sleep in my room. I had all that Star Wars stuff on the wall. I don't want to sleep up in there. So, you know, I go in my sister's room and I can get on the floor. She made me feel safe. Well, when, when her and my mom got into it, she went to go live with my auntie and my granny. Left me at home by myself. So, I had to do something again. Because at home, it was Kunta Kente City. <laughs> I mean, you know, I had to be in the bed at 10. I couldn't be on that phone. I could never get them keys to the car. Nothing. It was whack. It was like prison. I was like, man, I'm not trying to be like where daddy is. So, you know, occasionally she'd give me the keys to the car, go, go down there and come right back. Well, back then, you know, they had chiefs, chief auto store and all them places where you can get that car key made. Well, I went and got me a key made one time. I took that change in that, that ashtray. I said, I ain't going to be no more asking for them keys. <laughs> You know, she go out of town all the time, and it was kind of weird how you would leave me in the house, but take the keys to the car. The house worth more than the car, you know. So I had me some keys. She, we was rocking tapes back then. So when she went out of town, I make it seem like I was so sad. I'd be everywhere. The gas was cheap, <laughs> you know. It was eighty-eight cents a gallon, so we had we could roll. So. That was one of the perks of living at home because she was gone all the time. So all I had to do, you know, you, you, you grow up at an early age, like being responsible, waking up, getting on that bus, and, and doing your thing because, you know, I don't know if you believe it or not, but mom came up to Glencrest one time in sixth grade and, and beat me up in front of the class because Mr. Harlan had called and said I was being disruptive. And man, I remember that like yesterday, but nobody ever said nothing to me about it. But I'm sure it didn't they mind. They like, yeah, his mama came up here and beat him. You know? So we can't say nothing about that because he might click on us. Overall, you know, Damien has touched a lot of lives that people, like I said, have never... He doesn't always tell a story of the things that he's done for people. Um, He's very observant. I think we were driving one, he was driving one time and it was the middle of the night and he saw this guy laying in the grass. 
he turned around and, you know, gave him some water, gave him some money, he talked about our nonprofit, you know, so he's always willing to help everybody else. And that's that big heart that a lot of people don't see. He can be mean and tough, and he is. He is. But, you know, that's that, he's a combination of both. Um, yeah, I will basically say I had, I just saw him for the first time in about 10 years. I saw him about two months ago at Chili's and man, it was like a reunion. You know how you seen a relative that you ain't seen in 10 years and y'all like first cousins and due to you stay out of town or they stay out of town, whatever case you may be, you don't, you don't get to see him in. It just, I could have stayed the whole day with him, you know, just, just talking and like we used to do. And, and, but what I would say about him is that, um, we call it, excuse me, we call him Weezy. So when he, they called me about the interview with his real name, I'm like, I don't know what this is. I never knew his real name. You know, you get barbershop nicknames and all that type of stuff. But what I will say is that he is a guy, a young man, that I wish could teach in high schools, in junior high, young black men, whether regardless of their race, but I'm gonna start with young black men, how to be gentlemen. I, he just said genuine to me that we need a guy like him in junior high, elementary, to just teach young men how to handshake, how to say, how you doing? and really care, you know, <clears throat> versus just something to say. Well, he look at you doing all right, you know, man, that's good, you sure? You know, all right, all right. And he'll help anybody if you come to him correct and it makes sense, he got you, you know. So I just say, I wish we had a billion wheezes, you know, be a better world, a better world, more, more safe world, more education, more, more humble, and definitely more, I would say, um, wisdom, pass, pass it on to the next.